the complexity of action potential. Right? So we're going to cut our teeth today. Though. We're going to go slow, <laughs> relatively speaking, and we are going to just cover stuff that's not that difficult or that's reviewed. Right? What kind of a cell is that? That's a neuron. Don't tell me nerve cell. Nerve cell is not specific. Certainly don't tell me nerve, because a nerve doesn't mean a cell at all. It's a collection of cell parts, and we'll talk about that later. This is a neuron. From a lab, what are all these other little dots? Yeah, those are the neuroglial cells. There are going to be a bunch of different kinds of neuroglial cells. We're not covering that yet today, right? but we've already dealt with one upstairs in the lab. What's the one we've seen in the lab? The Schwann cell, right? Our myelinating cell, right? So, all right, so we're okay with this. What does it do, right? The nervous system is your main sensory apparatus, right? If you can detect it, chances are the nervous system is what is actually doing the detecting, right? There are exceptions to that, right? But where there are exceptions, right? Even then, the nervous system is involved. That information is going to be transmitted to the heart of the nervous system, right? The central nervous system, your brain and your spine. And then the significance of that sensory information is going to be decided, right? You're going to figure out what it means. You're going to combine it with sensory information from other parts of your body. And then the brain, or the spinal cord, as it turns out, will figure out what the best response is. And then it will send out marching orders to your effectors, the things that will affect the response. Two kinds of effectors that you deal with in general practice. Muscles and glands. Right? Every one of your muscles and every one of your glands, including every single little sweat gland and sebaceous gland in your skin, is wired into the nervous system. Right? They're going to be the things that we use to affect the response. Right? This should sound exactly like homeostasis. Sensor, control center, effector. Right? And it's not coincidental. Your nervous system is the heart of how homeostasis is maintained. Okay. And that shouldn't be a surprise. We covered that in very general terms back in the day. So what we're going to do in the beginning, right, for really the first chunk of today's lecture, is we are going to divide up into different subsets of the nervous system. We're going to provide some architecture. Our first major division is an easy one. We've got the central nervous system, which is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. Right? And then we've got the peripheral nervous system. All of what we will call nerves radiating out from the brain and from the spinal cord and going out and innervating other parts of the body. When I use the term innervate, right, what I'm saying is that some other structure is synapsing with a neuron, right? So when I say that a sweat gland is innervated, what I'm saying is that there is a neuron whose axon is synapsing with that gland and effectively turning it on and off, right? All right. Have we heard these terms before? Before? Uh, have we heard? I, I, I'm sure that we've heard central nervous system. Right? Have y'all heard peripheral nervous system before? All right, so this is easy so far. We're going to divide it up even further. So I've got the sensory division of the peripheral nervous system. Right? This, is the, this is what's responsible for perceiving the environment both on the outside, right? Clearly we can detect stuff going on on the outside. You can tell when something lands on your skin, right? You can see and hear and smell the world around you. You've got a lot of your sensory division though that is monitoring not the world outside, but is also monitoring the world
world inside. You can tell when you are in the middle of a myocardial infarction because it hurts, right? That's all the sensory division. So the sensory division, part of the peripheral nervous system, the actual neurons in the sensory division are called sensory neurons. They are, they are basically perceiving stimuli. Have you all used the term stimulus before? Right. Usually in the context of stimulus and then response. Again, coming back to that homeostasis stuff. Our stimuli can fall into a bunch of different categories, but basically it's going to, we're perceiving one of two things at the end of the day. We are perceiving the presence or absence of chemicals, right? Our sense of taste, for example, is the presence or absence of certain chemicals. Or we're sensing energy, right? When you sense pressure, you're sensing the force actually being applied to your skin, right? When we start talking actual examples of kinds of sensations and kinds of sensory mechanisms that will produce those sensations, right? We'll talk about more specifics of stimuli. Right? So there is a sensory neuron. There is some part of this sensory neuron called a receptor. A receptor is something that receives something, right? The actual receptor, usually it's some kind of protein on the actual surface of the neuron, although there are lots of different ways to accomplish this. The sensory receptor is the part of the neuron that actually senses the environment. And again, we can sense the outside world, we can sense the inside world. Right? One of the best examples of this ability to sense the internal environment right, is if you close your eyes, even with your eyes closed, you know exactly where your body and your limbs are in three-dimensional space so that you can easily reach out and touch your nose every single time, even though you're not looking, right? Y'all done this before? Mm -hmm. Anybody have to do it where it matters? Right? Okay. Anybody end up doing something like this before? <laughs> right? I, I passed. <laughs> This is proprioception, right? This sense of position, right? If you alter your neural networks chemically, right? If you alter these signaling pathways chemically, right? There's an effect. And one of the ways you tell intoxication is because it interferes with this sense of internal environment. What proprioception actually is doing is every single one of your skeletal muscles is innervated. Not just to control the contraction of the skeletal muscle, but it's got a separate set of innervations that are designed to detect how taut the muscle is, how contracted each and every one of your muscles are. And some of your ligaments and tendons also have their own stretch sensation to determine how much force there is pulling. And if you know how every one of your muscles is contracted, you know exactly where that limb is in three-dimensional space. We'll come back to this concept later. This is actually significant for a number of reasons, only one of which is this three-dimensional image of our body in space. So the sensory neurons can detect stretching. So not just the external environment, but also we're sensing the internal environment. When we've got that information, we're going to send it to the central nervous system, right? The brain and the spinal cord. Some part of this is then going to say, well, what does it all mean? And what does it all do? Right? So the central nervous system is receiving sensory information. It's going to figure out what it means, and it's going to then decide what the appropriate response is going to be. And then it's going to send out instructions to the effectors, right? And this is the motor division of the peripheral nervous system, right? Something that you may not realize, right? A lot of decisions are made 
that don't involve your brain at all. A lot of decisions are actually made in the spinal cord, not conscious ones. But for example, have you all done the one where you take the little mallet and you whack somebody's knee right below the kneecap? What happens? Yeah. yeah. You have a rapid extension of the lower leg. Your brain is not involved in that decision, right? That information about the sense of stretch on the patellar ligament goes right into the spinal cord, and then the motor effect comes right back out without involving your brain at all, right? Those are called spinal reflexes, and they are lots of them, right? And we'll deal with spinal reflexes probably in the next lecture. So the motor division is the part of the peripheral nervous system that is going to affect the response. The neurons that are part of the motor division are motor neurons, and we've already, told, we've already talked about motor neurons, right? What did we talk about as being innervated by, by motor neurons? Yeah, our skeletal muscle, right? So we've already seen these, right? Motor neurons, we can divide this motor division up even further. We can say they're the kind of motor neurons we've already talked about because they are innervating skeletal muscles. This is called the somatic nervous system. Somatic meaning of the body. We can also split off the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic meaning automated. This is what is controlling our involuntary muscle, right? Our cardiac muscle and our smooth muscle. And it is what's controlling our glands, right? So all of those sweat glands and sebaceous glands, you don't have to consciously think about producing earwax, right? Those ceruminous glands are doing their thing under the automation of this system here. So, are we doing okay so far? Yeah, all right. So, we can split up the motor division into the somatic and into the autonomic. The somatic is our voluntary control, mostly, right? But this is skeletal muscles. We can voluntarily control anything innervated by the somatic nervous system. But they can also be controlled involuntarily, right? And again, right, we just mentioned it. This patellar reflex where you've got the patella here, you've got a, basically a ligament, the patellar ligament that goes down to the tibial tuberosity, right? If you overly stretch that ligament by banging on it with a hammer, the body wants to prevent it from becoming too stretched to the point where it might break. And so it automatically pulls the leg back into position by contracting the quadriceps. Right? And you don't have to think about it. Right? It's being done automatically, even though it's part of the somatic nervous system. We'll come back to these reflexes in detail, and this will be a good example of one. Right? But again, these automatic patterns, these automatic controls of otherwise voluntary systems, they can be overridden. Right? One of the things the doctor will usually tell you when you're doing this is you have to relax your leg. Right? If you're consciously telling your muscles to keep it in position, it doesn't matter how he bangs on that patellar ligament. Right? You're not going to stimulate that reflex. Reflexes usually can be overridden, right? and we'll come back to this concept as well. The autonomic nervous system is involuntary. It is not under conscious control. It is controlling things that are also involuntary, like smooth and cardiac muscle, but also a lot of, glor a lot of glandular secretion. This is going to be a big part of AMP2 if AMP2 is going to be taught the way I think it's going to be. Right? Because the autonomic nervous system is, we're going to split this up, 
into the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. The lay term for this is your fight or flight response, right? Have you all heard of the, the expression fight or flight? This is the set of automatic reactions that are gearing your body up for action, for doing something, right? That doing something could be running so that you don't get eaten, right? It could be engaging in coitus with your favorite partner, right? All of this is action, and all of it is under the control of the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, right? Preparing you to do something. So there will be effects of sympathetic nervous activation, right? High stress for long periods of time, meaning continual activation of the sympathetic nervous system, that can be bad for you, and there are effects of that. One of the things that you should know is that studying continuously up until the point of the exam means you've got the sympathetic nervous system activated continually. And sympathetic activation inhibits memory storage and retrieval, right? Because your brain's not worried about the minor details. It just wants to get shit done, right? <laughs> So, it's best to stop studying and relax at least an hour or two before the exam to help your brain slow down and process some of this information. That would have been helpful about three tests ago. Maybe. <laughs> the other half of this is the parasympathetic branch, right? There is another kind of you know, lay term for this that's not as in wide circulation called the rest and digest, right? When you're being chased, right, you don't need to worry about whether or not you're efficiently metabolizing that last meal. But once you have gotten away, once your body starts to slow down, then you can do stuff like turn on digestion. This is going to be a big part of AMP2 as a result because one of the big things you do in AMP2 is that hole of the alimentary canal from mouth to anus. Okay? Is also right controlling renal functions. Right? You, when you are trying to get away from the thing that's chasing you, it's not a good time to stop and go pee. Right? So the sympathetic nervous system will inhibit renal function. Whereas the parasympathetic right, will start to increase renal function and the micturition reflex, which is how you void your bladder. Right? So what you will find is that in fact a lot of systems in AMP2 are going to be innervated by both of these things and they will have opposite effects on the same organ. Right? So, I suspect these are going to be big parts of AMP2. So this is our division. Nervous system into CNS and PNS, PNS and a motor and sensory motor and a somatic and autonomic, autonomic and a sympathetic and parasympathetic. We're going to have one more division that we'll do at the very end. We're going to divide up sensory into the general senses and the special senses. The special senses are the senses of the head. Sight, taste, smell, hearing. Everything else is general sensation. So one more division, but we're going to hold off on that. So, the parasympathetic branch is part of the central or the peripheral nervous system? Central. Parasympathetic, autonomic, the motor, the peripheral. Right. So, a sensory neuron is part of the CNS or the PNS. 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 Got to be. It was right there. Right. Yeah. So, we'll give other examples. We'll talk about neurons here versus neurons there if we have time. Right. Skeletal muscle contraction right, is innervated by the CNS or by the PNS. So, 
Now, best to be able to draw this out, just straight up. We're not talking about individual types of central nervous neurons, right? although there are lots. Most central nervous system neurons are connected with one another, right? These are the heavily involved branching pathways of the brain. Ultimately, there's connections between the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system and from the peripheral nervous system. But all of this stuff over here is all peripheral nervous system. All right, so we okay with that? We'll come back to this complexity in a little bit. Not today, but in a couple of years. So, that's a neuron. Okay. We saw the axon upstairs in the laboratory the other day. What's this here? That's the cell body. What's that? This is the nucleus. What are these things up here? Dendrites. Right? So we know all this from the lab already. So that's pretty easy. Signals are going to enter the neuron from adjacent neurons through the dendrites or through the cell body. They're going to leave the neuron through the axon. So there is a direction of information flow in on this side, out on this side. Right? That's going to be important because I'm going to give you three different kinds of neurons and the only way to tell what's what sometimes is if I give you information about the direction of information flow. Right? So the axon is what's transmitting the neural impulse out of the cell to another cell. This other cell could be another neuron, could be a muscle, could be a gland. There is only one axon per neuron, ever. Right? That's in contrast to dendrites. Some neurons have one dendrite, some have many. Right? There's always ever one axon, but this is confusing. Because what you will see is that that single axon, as it approaches the terminus, can branch. And if you go back and you look at those pictures of motor units back from the previous section, what you see is the axon then branches at the very end and innervates different muscle fibers. Right? Only one axon, though. Everybody understand? Lots of dendrites sometimes. Sometimes just one. This is how we're going to really start to categorize and buy the arrangement of the dendrites. The dendrites are receiving information from another cell. Or, if you are a sensory neuron, from whatever stimulus is generating an effect in the receptor. You can have lots of dendrites per neuron. It just depends on what type of neuron you are. The cell body, this is where most of the cytoplasm is and where most of the organelles are. You can also receive electrical communications at the body itself. Go up and look at those models of the neuron and you'll see that some of those synapses are on the dendrites and some of those synapses are on the body of that cell. Right, so you can receive information either at the dendrites or at the body. We already talked myelination upstairs in the lab. Right? What you should have learned was that <laughs> these are electrical signals we're sending down the length of the axon. And just like the wiring in our wall, sometimes you've got to insulate those wires. We're going to insulate our axon with something called the myelin sheath. What you do is you take the membrane from another cell and you wrap it around and around and around and around that axon. And that's going to insulate it. On Tuesday, we're going to talk a little bit about how that insulation actually works. Right? But that's not until Tuesday. And what's the name of the myelinating cell upstairs? A Schwann cell. Right? There's going to be another myelinating cell we'll deal with in here. Schwann cells are myelinating cells of the peripheral nervous system. We're going to introduce the one for the 
central nervous system when we get to it in the next lecture or so. So you can see it though, right? Not all of our axons are myelinated in our body. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Myelination is going to increase the speed of signal propagation. And they're going to make sure that it is done as energetically efficiently as possible. Right? So some of our axons don't need to be very efficient in their communication. It's okay if there's a lag. Right? Some of our communications need to be near instantaneous. Right? You don't want a long delay between your brain saying, do this, and your muscle actually contracting, because that makes it hard to coordinate things. So the faster that signal needs to be, the more likely that axon is to be modulated. Right? Why does um, the axon need to be insulated? Or have insulation on it? So again, this is something we will talk about in the next one. Insulation speeds up the rate of communication. Right? So in very simple terms, it allows you to communicate much more efficiently, much faster. Right? So if you ever who uses dial-up in here right, for their internet connection? Has anybody done dial-up connections before? Mm. All right, not my target audience, though, apparently. <laughs> so, have you, so do you know what I mean by lag in communication? Mm. Right? It's annoying, right? It's actually very detrimental if there's lag in communication between our neurons and the rest of our body. So it's really just about signal speed propagation. If you're asking about how, what it's physiologically doing, is that what your question is? That's complicated, and that's what we're going to do on <coughs> Tuesday. So can, can you wait? Yeah. Okay. At the end of the day, it insulates the axon, and it speeds up propagation of the neural impulse. The faster it goes, the more efficient your communication. So, again, just think about trying to do anything on your computer when your internet connection is sputtery or when you're going off of your 4G rather than your actual high-speed internet connection, right? It's just a pain. So, there's a gap in between myelinating cells, though, so, where you have a little bit of region of exposed axons. We call this in the lab the node of Ranvier. Right? Those of you not in my lab, did you all do that? Did they tell you what's happening with that node of Ranvier? Yeah. That's going to be Tuesday's lecture. This is going to be the heart of neural propagation, these little breaks in insulation. Right? We will talk about the physiology in gory detail, but not until Tuesday. Right? Just giving you some terms. Making sure you're ready for what's coming. So, this is comparatively easy. Three different kinds of neurons depending on the arrangement of the dendrites relative to the axon. Right? So in a multipolar neuron, you've got lots of dendrites on one end. You've got a single axon on the other. These are very, very common. Those central nervous system smears that y'all have upstairs, that's all you see. Okay? Most of the nervous system is multipolar neurons. This is because the larger your body, the more dendrites, the more connections you make. And function of the brain is a very direct mathematical proposition. The more connections you can make in your brain, the better your brain is able to function. So multipolar neurons in the central nervous system. Your, most of your motor neurons are also multipolar, and we'll see some of those today, actually. Ooh. Unipolar, most of your general sensory neurons, meaning your senses associated with your skin, your proprioception, most of those are unipolar. They have a cell body. They have a single stalk. 
that leads to one great big long process that goes off in either direction. We're going to arbitrarily designate one side, the very tippy tip of one side, the dendrite, and the whole rest of it is axon. The only way to tell which is which is if I tell you the direction of the communication. I would have to tell you that the signal is going from here to here in order for you to know that this is the dendrite and this is the axon. Right? If I don't give you that information, you can't tell. We will see where these are today because when we go upstairs and start dealing with the spinal cord, right, I'll point out where these bodies of your sensory neurons are. Right? Most general sensory neurons are unipolar. Bipolar neurons have a dendrite on one side, axon on the other. You can't tell the difference though unless I tell you the direction of signal propagation again. These are relatively rare where you find them is often associated with the special senses, your senses associated with your head. The one that we're going to give a name to is in vision. Because in vision, you would call them rods and cones. Have you all done rods and cones? <laughs> Nobody's done rods and cones before in high school? Okay, a couple of you. Which one is black and white? I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, it's all. Oh, cone is color. Yeah, there you go. C for color. Excellent. All right. So now, action potential. Neurons are communicating by electrical impulses. We should all know that at this point. We should all know this slide. Calcium and sodium on the outside, potassium on the inside. I had a lot of people miss this question, despite the fact that I told you this is the most important thing, and it's going to be on every single assessment from here to the end, right? And sure enough, it's on that first homework assignment, right? So, calcium and sodium on the outside, potassium on the inside. Our anions, there are going to be two I'm going to hold you responsible for. Chlorine on the outside, right? That's why there's sodium chloride in the blood, and that's why it's salty. You've got a lot more protein on the inside, though, than you do on the outside. And most proteins carry a negative charge, making them anionic. If you were to take the numbers of every single one of the cations and anions, and add them up and multiply them by their charge, you would be able to figure out the overall polarity of the membrane. Slightly positive on the outside, slightly negative on the inside. Again, we've done this already. Right? So the result is some kind of voltage, right? This membrane carries a voltage, and so it is said to be polar. Right? Do we remember all this from the last one? Mm -hmm. All right, good. This is called the resting membrane potential. This is what you have in a cell that is not currently communicating. When we communicate, we're going to move ions around and change this resting potential. So, action potentials. Neurons communicate by electrical impulses. We're going to move ions by a facilitated diffusion from one side of the membrane to the other. What we have talked about so far is what happens when you depolarize the membrane, right? Because what we said is the only one we cared about was sodium. You move sodium from outside to inside, you depolarize, that generated an action potential. We are going to talk about the dynamic nature of action potential, right? About how it's a wave of moving depolarization. We're really going to hit that part this time for real. Got my membrane, got my ions, got my other ions, got a voltage. What happens to the voltage? What happens to this number if I take sodium and move it here? Does this number get closer to zero or does it get farther from zero? It gets closer to zero, right? That's what we said it means to be depolarized. What happens if you move calcium? 
Same. Same thing. It gets depolarized. If you move a positive charge to the negative side, that's going to bring this closer to zero, and that's going to depolarize your membrane. So, movement of sodium and calcium will depolarize the membrane. If you do that enough, you generate an action potential in the cell that is becoming depolarized. Okay. So, we said that we needed a channel. We said that if it continues unabated, you end up at zero millivolts. That's fully depolarized. Okay, now let's put it into some context. Got a neuron, cell body, axon. I have the synapse, right? The junction of one cell and another. This is not a neuromuscular synapse. This is an interneuronal synapse. There is a cleft in the middle. What are we going to dump into the cleft when the action potential reached the end? Acetylcholine. It was acetylcholine and a neuromuscular synapse. It could be any one of a bazillion different neurotransmitters. Right? Neurotransmitter, though. We're going to stick with acetylcholine today because that's what we know. We're going to get a little more complicated on the next step. So action potential reaches the presynaptic terminal. The presynaptic terminal is loaded up with vesicles carrying neurotransmitter. It was acetylcholine when we were talking muscles. There are also interneuronal junctions that use acetylcholine as well. Right? So acetylcholine is found in different places. We said that you're going to release it in here. We glossed over the next step and said sodium is then going to move into the postsynaptic terminal. And okay, now we're going to come back and look at that thing right there. Right? So this is important though. I want to stress that, right? And I'm going to do it with my favorite subject, something I actually care about, which is microbiology. Have you all heard of botulism before? Mm -hmm. So botulism is a disease. Right? If you go to your cupboard and you have a can of something and the can is dented outward, don't eat it. Right? It means that there is some organism on the inside that is currently digesting your food and producing gas. And the gas causes the can to dent outward. One of the things produces a very, very nasty toxin called botulinum toxin. It blocks the exocytosis of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Since that controls muscle contraction, the presence of botulinum toxin prevents contraction of the muscles. The result is flaccid paralysis. Why does flaccid paralysis kill you? Your heart's tired. Heart would be a good idea, yeah. but it's actually just skeletal muscle in this case. Oh. It's the diaphragm, right? And then you lose respiratory function. So this is the most potent toxin we've discovered to date, at least as the time as I was researching this. You pounds of this stuff, if distributed correctly, would kill it every single person on the planet. Okay. That's unfortunate because people now intentionally inject this into their face to get rid of wrinkles. Right? Botox is short for botulinum toxin. And it smooths out your wrinkles because it paralyzes the muscles in your face. Right? I gotta say, that does not seem like a good idea to me. Right? So, all of this is practically important. There are so many toxins and pharmacopoeia and recreational drugs that work because they are blocking some part of this process of signaling, or they are modifying some part. And we'll mention others as we go along. So, lots of different neurotransmitters. We've been dealing with acetylcholine. There are two different kinds of neurotransmitters. Excitatory is all that we have dealt with. Excitatory signals depolarize the downstream cell. They depolarize the postsynaptic terminal. 
Inhibitory neurotransmitters are going to do the opposite. What's the opposite of depolarization? Hyperpolarization. We will get to inhibitory signaling in the next lecture. We're going to stick with excitatory because it's what we know. <laughs> excitatory signals depolarize the membrane of the postsynaptic terminal. Your book uses this obnoxious term. What I want you to understand is that anything that is depolarizing is excitatory. Right? That's a one-to-one -one relationship. So our example of an excitatory one is our cholinergic synapse. Cholinergic meaning it uses acetylcholine. Big example of this is the neuromuscular synapse for skeletal muscles. Lots of acetylcholine, right? Lots of cholinergic synapses between neurons as well. Your book goes into more information about that kind of thing than I will. I am just picking ones that illustrate examples. If you are interested in this sort of thing, if you are interested in dopamine or in norepinephrine or in all of these other kinds of neurotransmitters, your book is a good place to start, although it's not great. So in our neuromuscular synapse or in a cholinergic uh, interneuronal synapse, you got acetylcholine here, it gets the signal, it dumps it in. This is going to have an effect on what that video called a ligand-gated ion channel. So a ligand is something that binds to something else. Our ligand is going to be our neurotransmitter. Gate means exactly what it sounds like. It's something that will open and close. Our facilitated diffusion channel is normally closed, but we're going to open it up when the ligand binds to it. Right, so that's where the terminology is coming from. And it's ligand-gated ion channel because we're moving an ion from one slide to another. Right? In this case, it was sodium, right? but it could have been calcium or any of the other ones. So a ligand-gated ion channel allows facilitated diffusion, usually of a very specific ion. It's normally closed, but in the presence of the neurotransmitter, that channel opens up. And when it opens up, when the floodgates are open, the ion will move from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So, slightly positive, slightly negative, sodium on the outside, because that's where we said sodium was. Right now, in a cell at rest, at resting membrane potential, this is closed. But all of a sudden, we are awash in acetylcholine. The acetylcholine binds to the channel. The channel opens, right? And once it's open, you get facilitated diffusion. And what's that going to do to my polarity? It's going to depolarize. It's going to get close to zero. Right? So are we following the logic now of these steps? All right. Acetylcholine binds to the ligand channel. Channel opens. Sodium flows. Membranes depolarize. Polarize the membrane enough that will generate a subsequent action potential. That action potential and how it's actually generated, that's complicated. That'll be Tuesday as well. Don't miss Tuesday's lecture. Okay. So, we generate an action potential that releases neurotransmitter, depolarizes the postsynaptic terminal. If that happens enough, you generate an action potential here as well. Okay. So, are you following? So again, this whole process is modifiable, right? For example, Professor Wirt used to smoke. Professor Wirt really liked to smoke, right? And we'll talk about why that is too, right? Professor Wirt doesn't smoke anymore because it's bad for you, as it turns out. Did y'all know that? Smoking is bad for you. But it's also really, really expensive now. When I started smoking, it was a buck fifty a pack. And now it is like seven or eight dollars a pack. I, I I don't know. It's been a long time. Is is that what it is? Does anybody want to volunteer this? Yeah. So when I was in graduate school, I was much too poor, and I was actually putting my wife through nursing school, which means I really had no money. So so I don't do this anymore. Nicotine is usually why people smoke. 
Nicotine works because it binds to acetylcholine gated channels, right? And it opens them up, even though there's no signal from the preceding neuron. Okay? That generates an action potential in that cell. So what nicotine is doing is it is changing your chemistry within your brain because it's affecting at first cholinergic synapses between neurons in the central nervous system. Right? So normally you need an action potential here in order to tell this one that it needs to do something. But when you smoke, that nicotine opens up these channels inappropriately and that generates an action potential. And whatever is at the end of the line is being turned on. Right? The reason people smoke is because it's pleasurable. It actually will activate some of the central nervous system reward centers in your brain. Right? That's a lot of the addiction, particularly the mental aspect of the addiction. There's a physical aspect though. Quitting is tough. Right? And that's because you are permanently modifying your brain chemistry when you expose yourself to these substances. Not just nicotine, any of these things that we will mention as we go along and many, many more. These are often permanent or very hard to reverse changes in how your brain works. And you should always be careful because everything that you are is right up in here and the ancillary structures. Now, if you smoke too much in a row, right, there are other effects because it's not just these inner neuronal ones that are hooked into the reward center that use acetylcholine. There are ones in muscular stuff too, and it can cause you to get jittery through sympathetic activation and through twitching or through activation of some of these neuromuscular ones. Eventually, you can actually kill yourself with nicotine. Usually not enough in cigarettes to do it. We used to spray nicotine on plants, though, because it messes up insect nervous systems, too. Did you have a question? And so it actually is a very effective insecticide, right? We stopped using it for the most part, though, because as it turns out, it's killing a lot of other things in the process, a lot of small mammals, right? And there's a potential for human toxicity as well from nicotine. What's up, sir? Okay, now, cigarettes are stimulants, right? Yes. They don't, they make people relax, but it's a stimulant. It's a stimulant because it's activating, some of these inner neuronal ones are feeding into the sympathetic nervous system. It's really only a relaxant in the sense that in the, when you are withdrawing from this response, right, your body gets used to having this there and gets used to this neuronal activation. And so when you don't have it, it starts to cause the other aspects, right? When you start turning off these things in the absence of nicotine, there's a whole bunch of ripple effects that happen that people interpret as withdrawal. And so it seems relaxing then if you add back because it brings you back to normal. So technically though, you can market food as organic if you use nicotine as your insecticide because nicotine is all natural. Right? So natural does not always mean good for you. So, all right, so that's pretty much the end for today. What we are going to next ask on Tuesday is what happens if you move chlorine to the other side. And then we're going to expand on how you actually generate the action potential once you do that initial depolarizing event. Or what happens if you move potassium to the other side. So, I think that's where I stop on the other one. Where does the one I posted go to? Does it does it go any further? No. Yeah, right. it went to the one right before the last one. It goes there? Yeah. No. There? Yeah. yeah. Okay.
That's perfect. That's where I'm out of the class and ended. All right. So a little preview of my.